So the conversation about consent and uh, understanding and communicating your boundaries, that's an important one. Yeah. And just um, on that topic of consent, obviously, I think that consent should be introduced into the conversation, whether it's about sex or not, you know, consenting to people should have the right to consent to anything that happens to their body um, or in a relationship. And if you have kids, you know, really talking to your, introducing that topic really early, not about sex necessarily, but, you know, one of the examples that's often given is sometimes we tell kids to, you know, go give so-and-so a hug, or, you know, we ask them to make physical contact without asking if it's okay uh, with them. And I know it might seem a little bit, you know, over the top or silly, but I think that, you know, asking kids like, do you want to give them a hug and making it their choice and setting this precedent of, when someone touches your body, that is your choice, right? Or setting the precedent so that when it comes to sex, that concept is much easier and more intuitive because they've already been practicing consent for years in other contexts. I love it. Yeah, kids kids are like, the future is here, man. They, I hope that a lot of kids are getting better messaging now that the conversation about consent has become a little bit more mainstream. I think that's a really wonderful thing. Yeah, I, I remember learning about this good touch, bad touch sort of program with kids. I don't know if that's kosher yeah. or not, but just yeah, talking yeah. explicitly with kids about body parts and what should and shouldn't be touched and what should mm -hmm. happen if, if they are touched by someone mm -hmm. in a place that's not appropriate. It just seems like proactive education with kids could really go 100%. a long way. Yeah, I think good touch, bad touch is a great paradigm for helping kids understand what's okay and what's not. And having that be an ongoing conversation, I think if, if that were the case everywhere, then we might be able to help child abuse survivors earlier because they'd have the language and the space to be talking about the things that are happening with other adults in their life. I love it. Jenna writes, I love this is being discussed. I know so many people who should listen to this. I will be recommending. Oh, well, thank you very much. I'm glad it's right. useful. We're striking a chord. Yeah, All right. What's up? What really else is up? This... Oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, I really wish this stuff were, you know, there were more spaces for this. And I really appreciate you making the space to talk about this kind of stuff. I did not have any of this when I was younger and particularly not in like my post Mormon struggles. So I think it's really cool. Oh, good. Yeah. Well, it's, you know, aside from like sleep and water and food and maybe education and community, like sex is one of the most fundamental primary human needs. I think I'm sure Maslow's got a low on his triangle, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I think it's a beautiful part of life and it can be a beautiful part of relationships. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's sad that, we have a lot of, we learn a lot of distorted, messy, uh, harmful ideas about it, all of us in our culture, and all of us can be part of that change, you know, it's about the collective conscience sort of shifting, and it doesn't mean getting, like, changing the culture around this stuff doesn't require every single person to 100% agree, or, you know, to adopt all the same practices, it's really just about tipping tipping the culture in a direction of being more sex positive, more open, more communicative. I think that has a tremendous impact and maybe it's starting to happen. I like to think it is. I think so. Yeah. I think so. Yeah. All right. What else is on your list? I've got a couple thoughts or questions for after, but I want to make sure we get through with the things you have listed. I, I think that was everything. I mean, we, t the only one we didn't, we did talk about it, but, um, that I had explicitly on here was just to masturbate. So <laughs> that's number 10, masturbate. Get out there, <laughs> get out there and, you know, have some fun with yourself on your own terms when you feel safe, when you feel horny, whatever it might be, you know, just give yourself permission to have some you time. Now, is there, and, and I know the answer to this, but I'm going to give you a softball for educational purposes. Uh, is there scientific research that actually says that masturbation is healthy? Yeah. Of course there is. <laughs> There's a lot of research. What's healthy about masturbation when What's we've been healthy? so primed, when we've been so primed to think it's, it'll make you gay, it'll oh, make goodness. you blind, 
it'll it 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 um it's evil it's sinful it's lustful mm -hmm. uh you know they're all it's dirty there are all sorts of things we've been conditioned to think and feel for decades yeah so yeah we need to be taught why it's good <laughs> yeah i mean i think the main reason why it's good is that it feels good and it doesn't hurt anybody and it gives us a nice safe outlet for our normal natural human feelings and it you know it's a part of life you get a little pent up, you get a little stressed out, whatever. It can be a nice, harmless way to relax. But there's also research about how masturbation has some health benefits. I think sometimes people overstate the health benefits, but they uh, are definitely there. There's some research about how it is. Um, it can help prevent prostate cancer. I think just kind of clearing the pipes, more or less. <laughs> Um, there's research about how it can help you sleep better. Obviously, there's a lot of um, hormones that are released in the brain into the blood that help you relax, can reduce stress, can help you focus, clear your mind, um, generates intimacy, orgasm in general, um, generates intimacy and bonding. Just all this feel good stuff that. Um, our wonderful physiological responses that we have, and there's nothing wrong with enjoying those. There may be some other, you know, new uh, research about medical benefits of masturbation, but I think the best reason of all is just that we're sexual. Most people are sexual creatures, and, you know, it's a really harmless way to explore your sexuality and to feel good. I love it. Stress. Life is stressful. Let's not make it more stressful than it needs to be. Uh, usually, usually when people, at least when men masturbate, and I'm, I'm, I haven't talked to enough women to know if this is true for women, it's helpful to. Sometimes you can do that just by conjuring images or just kind of going, you know, going at it completely solo, so to speak. Other times, it's useful to see images. And sometimes yeah. those images are erotic and sometimes they're, they're porn. You talked a little bit about porn previously in terms of whether a couple can use it as a form of erotica to help enhance their mm -hmm. mutual relationship. But I imagine there's probably pros and cons to individual use of porn. We've mm -hmm. talked about that quite a bit on Mormon Stories. Uh -huh. Do you have, you know, sort of like uh, thoughts on or approaches about healthy or unhealthy porn or porn good, porn bad, or porn okay, hmm. and just just w as, as sort of a, a companion to self-stimulation. Yeah, um, I don't think there's anything wrong with using porn. Um, I would caution against only using porn. That's the main advice that I give when it comes to porn because I think only using porn can condition you to only respond to certain types of stimulus. and um, this is a new area of research and it's highly politicized. So it's hard to know like what exactly is happening here with, with porn usage and how it affects desire, how it affects erections, whatever the case may be. So, you know, in general, I just take a moderate approach, you know, use it, have fun. Don't get too crazy. If you're watching porn for four hours a day, it's probably too much, you know, <laughs> keep it in everything in moderation. And the other thing I would note about porn usage is to make sure it is ethical porn consumption. Um, now talk about that. What's, what's unethical porn and what's ethical porn? And then how do you find ethical porn? Yeah. Um, so there's a lot of stolen porn online. There's uh, images and videos that get uploaded that are of trafficked people. There's a lot, it's a big mess. Um, and, you know, nobody wants to participate in that or contribute to um, these black market industries that exploit usually women, but can exploit men as well. And sometimes children, right? And children. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, it's nasty. And, you know, the big one is Pornhub and it's really in vogue right now to be like, wow, porn, it's so great. And look at all this money they're donating to the environment. And Pornhub also regularly steal, they monetize stolen content. They are participating in all these things we're talking about. And I am very, very skeptical of the big porn tube sites. I, it just blows my mind. Um, 
how much content they steal on a daily basis. So that's messed up. If there is a performer you like, go to their website and get it from them directly. There are other two, there are tube sites you can subscribe to that are ethically sourced. Then when you go directly to the source, you have a much higher chance of making sure that those performers are being paid. They are not being exploited. They're doing it of their own consent and free will. And, you know, if you are participating in a erotic artistic process rather than a exploitative process. Now, as far as where to go to find this stuff, well, it really depends on your taste. But I will tell you there is a porn company independently operated for every possible taste you could have. You just got to do a little research. Um, personally, my favorite is Erica Lust's stuff. She is a producer, a feminist producer that's based out of Spain. She started this project called X Confessions, and it's basically she invites women to share their fantasies. And then they make artistic porn videos, bringing these fan fantasies to life. It's not necessarily like fat material all the time, <laughs> but um, it's really fun and it's sexy and it's sweet and everybody involved really wants to be there and is really enjoying themselves. It's very real. It features real bodies, real people, real relationships. And I love that personally. That's not going to be for everyone, right? Everyone's taste is different. So I would say do a little research and, and find artists that you can support. It's usually not that expensive to subscribe. Um, and it d makes a world of difference for a lot of these performers to make sure they have good working conditions, health care, things like that. Yeah. And because we're not, there's no endorsements going on here, I'll post a link to that. That's Erica Lust, E R I K A Lust.com. Yeah. That's yeah, she's great. Um, I guess the, I guess somebody who's either lazy or cheap is going to say, well, you have to pay for that stuff, right? You do. And, you know, that's part of the, it's a conundrum of the digital economy that we, we live in is that we're used to getting things for free. And I am just as guilty of this as uh, anyone else. You know, we expect all of these things to be free. And I think, you know, when it comes to like pirating movies or whatever, there's like a little more room to justify it ethically, even if it's not entirely ethical to pirate stuff. Um, at least in that case, the victims of pirating are these giant film companies and actors that are being paid 20, 30, 40 million dollars to be in these movies, right? Like they're not suffering. But when it comes to porn, a lot of these people are. And this the situation situation is very different. They don't have nearly as much power as these feature film, uh, these feature films do, right? Um, and so I think it's important to look at the power dynamic there. And if you are able to, to do your part, um, I realize it's not feasible for everyone and not everyone's going to do that, but I'm still going to say it. <laughs> I think it's important. I love it. Um, and then you can feel good too. You can feel good while you fap. You're like, hell yeah, I'm supporting sexy art and these people are having fun and I'm having fun and everyone wins. <laughs> the, there are, uh, the, the common things you hear about a porn can be that it sets unrealistic expectations. Yeah. Um, that it's not a great source for education. True. Um, if you're in a commit, if you're in a relationship, some sort of a relationship that involves sex, I guess it's possible that you can deplete your ability to be with your partner if you're kind of exhausting uh, yourself alone with porn. So it can it can sometimes run counter to uh, the, the sexual relationship with the partner. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, well, other other sort of disadvantages to porn or or, or downsides. Um. Well, I, definitely like 100% everything you just said. Um, I also think that this is, I'm not sure how common this is. I know it happens because I've talked to guys who have experienced this. How common it is, don't know. But I think there are some guys who um, turn to porn to escape relationship problems. So it becomes sort of a coping mechanism, right? Rather than a sexy fun time tool. Um, and so I, I would say think critically about how you're using porn, how you feel when you use it. 
um, and to make sure that it's, it is escapism, obviously, and it's okay for it to be escapism, but what are you escaping from? You know, if you're escaping from your relationship or for life, from life and problems, I would say, you know, let's take a step back and, and think about what porn is standing in for, you know, does that make sense? Yeah, it totally makes sense. Yeah. Um, okay. A few other questions. So, um, I, Natasha has said this before, and I even had one or two of my own children say this to me. Um, number one, the term prostitute is sort of a, a term maybe that shouldn't be used these days. Tell me if that's true. I've heard the term sex workers is a, is a more respectful term. Mm -hmm. And then if we're going to talk about sex workers, whether it's actors in, in, in pornography movies or even people who engage in sexual acts for money, of course, we're all trained to think that's just bad and evil. You should never, you know, do anything like that. You should never act in a, in a porn movie. You should never, um, you know, engage in, in sex for money. There's even this something that's come up at the University of Utah, and I don't want to plant ideas in people's heads, but it's a reality. I think there may have even been a death recently over this of, like, university students that um, – get sort of earn their sort of make make money for school by offering their sexual services to adults in the surrounding area do you have thoughts around all that is it just awful and bad or is it not our place to judge what what is your view on those sorts of things Lacey oh gosh hit, hit me with the tough ones is that now. a tough one <laughs> that is a tough one because I think that I, like a lot of people, have a lot of conflicting feelings about this issue. And it's incredibly complex. It's hard to speak in general terms, right? Like each case is different. Um, in general, I would say, yes, sex worker is considered the proper terminology, just FYI. Um, but in terms of if it's okay, if it's morally wrong, if it's morally right, I think that we should do everything we can to to avoid creating um, more exploitation of people um, and that we should con seriously consider uh, what consent looks like in these situations where money is involved. We need to think critically about uh, power dynamics that exist. And, you know, if students are feeling like they have to do this in order to get their education. I think that's a problem. So there's nothing wrong with doing sex work as long as someone is really fully consenting to it, you know, and it's really all about that and is able to consent to it. Um, some people say, well, you know, there's always going to be a power dynamic. Every job we do, uh, capitalism is inherently exploitative, <laughs> you know, like our labor is exploited. We don't get paid what our labor is worth because we have to pay off Every rung of the ladder, you know, the CEOs, the, the job makers, whatever, they have to take their cut too. So, of course, it's exploitative. I mean, that gets into some real philosophically difficult area for me. But in general, I'm very concerned about the exploitation of people. And I'm also very concerned about the right of people to do what they want with their bodies. So, insofar as we have to figure out how to do both of those things at once, it's easier on a case by case basis. I don't fully have any like hard line. Here's how I feel about it on that. But at least you've been able to share with us some factors to consider. Yeah. I mean, the, the liberation of people requires being able to identify exploitative circumstances. It also requires us to not be creating puritanical laws that tell people what they can and can't do with their bodies. So in some situations, you know, those things are intention. There's a tension there between, oh, is this person, you know, doing this because they really want to? To what degree is it okay for someone to be compelled to do things that they don't want to because that's the society we live in? Ugh, it's a big mess. Yeah. One one of the things, and I'm I'm going to talk about something that that could get really hot uh, in terms of like controversial, is is this I like I'm seeing massage parlors pop up all throughout Salt Lake City, mm. literally like two or three per block. Well, and and 
two things that I'm I'm guessing are are going to become issues or possibly could be issues or already are issues. Number one, it it I I worry that 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 some of the workers in some of these parlors might be people that are trafficked here in the United States. Have you heard about any of that happening? Yes. Uh, yes, that definitely happens. And massage parlors are one of the fronts that sex traffickers use. That's not to say they're definitely being sex trafficked, but does that happen? 100%. Yeah. Yeah. And so being thoughtful about even, even for massages, kind of, you know, what is the, what are the standards? What's the quality? What's the certification level? Mm -hmm. um, are, are people licensed? And is it a reputable shop versus not? Because that person who is massaging you may not be doing that fully. Uh, you want to, would we say against their will? What would you say? Or just of their own accord? Yeah. Or, or maybe exploitative circumstances or. Yeah. The circumstances are exploitative. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean that's oh, there's so much there's so much to be said about all of that, um, and it's not my area of expertise, but it definitely um, distresses me. You know, I think that people should be able to get a hand job if they want, and the person is down for it. You know, I don't think that's necessarily like the most exploitative situation, but if people are being trafficked and compelled to do that kind of stuff against their will, um, and even if it's like kind of more subtly against their will, right? Like they're being compelled to do it because it's the only choice they have. I feel a lot of not good feelings about that and worry and distress. The other scenario that I imagine is happening, and I, I think I first heard about this in uh, Esther Perel book called um, State of Affairs, mm -hmm. just the idea of a, of a spouse going to a massage parlor, like you said, to get a happy ending but maybe that's not something done. Maybe it is something done with the full awareness and consent of a spouse, but maybe it's not. Mm. And maybe it's a way to sort of get physical intimacy outside the bonds of marriage, but yeah. to kind of justify it. And Esther Pearl asks, is that, is that cheating or not? You know, um, and I guess every couple has to have their own agreement, but I think there are probably a lot of couples, especially Mormons and post-Mormons in Utah, that don't think to talk about that kind of stuff, right? Yeah, and I'd say if you haven't explicitly talked about it, then it is cheating because that's not like a, it's usually assumed culturally that sexual experiences are only being had with your spouse. So if you're having sexual experience or yourself, I guess, but if you're going outside to another person, I think most people, I could be very wrong about this, but I would assume that most people think yeah, that's some sort of extramarital sexual experience. Um, and so that's something that should be talked about. Yeah. Is it the same as having an affair? No, you know, those are different things. But is it something that people assume is good, like cool out the bat culturally? I don't think so. I think that's something that people have to talk about. Um, and, you know, maybe you'll decide that's a nice compromise for someone to get a, you know, a little extra novelty, a few extra kicks. Um, to make them happy and it's relatively harmless, or maybe you'll feel like there's something wrong with it. You know, it's, you're not okay with it. I think where it might get risky or problematic is if you're, if you're, if things are right in the relationship you're in and, or if things aren't, you know, talked about explicitly, and then you get in the habit of hiding and sneaking away yeah. and getting your needs met from external sources. Mm -hmm. My gut instinct says that that can probably become a slippery slope mm. that can lead to things that will really wreck your relationship if you don't want it wrecked. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you have to be honest and open about those things. And it's really, you know, in that, in that scenario, it's about, you know, what are you seeking from that experience? There's obviously something, it's something that you're not getting from the relationship and whether or not that's something that can be resolved or, comp you know, through compromise or kind of changing up your habits or whatever is a different story. But keeping those things a secret, I think most people agree is, is not okay. And I would, I think people keep know that they know that it's not okay. They feel shame about it. And I would say, you know, you're kind of creating your own personal hell in, in doing that and no, it's not easy to have that conversation and no, it's not easy to, 
talk about things that aren't working to say, look, I'm bored or look, this is not doing it for me. Those are hard conversations to have. But are those conversations way so much harder than telling your partner, hey, like, I, I need, I need, you know, I went out and got, I don't know, <laughs> a hand job or whatever it was. That's going to be much worse because then you're introducing lies and betrayal and mislead, you know, you misled your partner and it ruins trust. It's very hard to reestablish trust, you know, so it's better to say, look, I know this isn't a pleasant feeling that I'm having and I wish I wasn't having it, but I am. And I want to be honest about how I feel. So let's figure out some solutions together and see a counselor or, you know, do what you need to do to, to solve that in a way that's not going to wreck your life. Cause it will come out like you, you'll either live with a forever guilty hell in your mind or you'll be found out and it's going to be really awful. Yeah. I'll, I'll uh, I'll be super vulnerable here, and if this only helps one person, I'll feel glad about sharing it. But I I found myself as, as these massage parlors started popping up around where I work, I found myself wanting to go, and I I think I found myself wanting to go because I was hoping, you know, as they say, kind of for a happy ending. And it was really starting to torment me, where I was thinking about it all the time, and um what I ended up doing was just on a walk with Margie talking to her about it. And I just uh -huh. said, Hey, this is going to be hard. I feel bad about this. I'm not proud of this, you know, but it's really been bugging me. And I'm worried that if I just ignore it, I'm going to, I'm going to do something that could hurt our relationship. So, mm -hmm. so she's like bracing herself. And, <laughs> and I told her, I said, I'm, I'm really having these urges to go to a, um, a massage parlor hoping that that something like that will happen. And, um, and, and by the way, I, I know couples where they agree that that's okay. It's like, Hey, if you're on a business trip and so I'm not saying that that's a bad thing, but I think going without talking to Margie absolutely would be a bad thing. Totally, and, yeah, yeah. and I think there are risks, even if there's a full agreement with the couple. But anyway, what I loved is that Margie was super cool about it you know, she was a little bit sad or a little bit shaken or a little bit scared at first because I don't think she mm -hmm. saw that coming. What I loved about it was she didn't shame me. She didn't make me feel bad about it. She didn't like, you know, yell at me. And I loved that something magical happened. Once I talked to her about it, my desire to go do that went away. Ah, and I wanted ah. it to go away because I don't want to do anything that would hurt my relationship. Mm-hmm. And so that, I, that was the most magical, powerful thing about it is I've had no desire or interest or temptation for months after just being vulnerable mm. and having that conversation with her. Thanks for sharing that story, John. I think that's really cool to be open about because I think a lot of people maybe find themselves in similar situations but aren't so mm. willing to, to share. Um, yeah, I think that's really cool. And it's interesting that you know, part of the, what was drawing you to it was maybe like the taboo or like feeling like you couldn't share these things with her and you got closer through the experience. And I think that definitely can happen. And that's wonderful. <clears throat> yeah. And, and I'm, I'm guessing not all spouses are going to be as understanding as Margie. Um, and, and especially sometimes, you know, any sort of sexual exploration outside of like missionary heterosexual sex within the Mormon minds can be just shocking and awful. And there's a lot of men and or women in Mormonism that have been super shamed forever masturbating or looking at porn. Mm -hmm. And so, and, and, and we've, we've, we've associated some of those things like, you know, they say porn is the new drug and, and it's like worse than drug addiction and it's worse than cheating or it is cheating. And, 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 um, it can be a really charged thing. And so I'm also just acknowledging that that probably not all spouses are going to react the same way Margie did. And that when that happens, it can be deeply troubling and disturbing and feel mm -hmm. unsafe and it can backfire, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, it's about the environment and openness around these topics, making it okay to talk about them. If it's already really stigmatized and a point of stress and, and conflict, yeah, that's that's much more difficult and an unenviable position to be in. But yeah, thinking about it through the lens of your relationship, I think helps 
but don't discount your own own needs either, you know, or your own feelings, what you're feeling. But I'm just going to say, if this is just my opinion, my experience, if any of you are in a committed relationship where you're tempted to violate the trust of your partner and do something because you're afraid of talking about it, my my advice is talk to them before you do the thing because mm-hmm. because the the damage the risks and the damage of violating that trust and you've already mentioned this Lacey the risks and the damage of violating that trust is usually far bigger than the risks or the damage of having the conversation mm-hmm. and even if worst case scenario the conversation leads to discussions that lead to a separation or an end of the relationship because they're just irreconcilable values or needs. My opinion is it's better to end the relationship without the massive breach of trust than it is to end the relationship on this massive breach of trust. I think everybody benefits through that, that sort of honesty and candor. Now I don't want to say everybody there always are going to be exceptions, but just generally, my advice as a coach is have the hard conversation, rip the Band-Aid off now because it's a little pain now or potentially a massive amount of pain later. Well said. Are you, is that okay? Does that sound all right from your oh, perspective? Sounds great from my perspective. <clears throat> yeah. yeah, totally agree. And living with guilt and guilt, like self-imposed guilt and shame mm-hmm. can really take years off your life. It can... Mm-hmm. Affect stress. your sleep, your stress, your cortisol, your mental health, mm-hmm. depression. Just living with secrets and and uh, and guilt is just it's unhealthy for everyone. Yeah, it's no try not try not to do that. <laughs> <laughs> try to avoid all of that. Yeah, toxics do. A couple comments from our I'm listeners, Lacey. Out a little bit. Oh, sorry. Say that again. You're you're back. You cut out for a second. Oh, okay. Sorry about that. A couple quick comments from our listeners. You you're very generous with your time. We'll be wrapping up super quick. Um, so Tiffany writes, I do not agree with good touch and bad touch. So when they get older, if it feels good, it's okay. When someone is abusing them, it feels good, so it's okay. Question mark. So what would you say to Tiffany, who's got some concerns about this idea of good touch and bad touch? Let me make sure I'm understanding correctly. Like the idea that sexual touch is always bad. You sort of prime a kid to think that stuff that might feel good is wrong. I think she's misunderstanding what the good touch, bad touch program is, because I think she's basically saying if a touch feels good, it's okay. And if a touch feels bad, it's not okay. And that's not the good touch, bad touch program that I'm aware of is where kids are shown sort of a zones of the body for women, the breasts, and then for women and and men, the genitals, and then the buttocks for both. And it's basically, you should never touch anyone in these places unless there's, I don't even know if they say with kids unless there's consent, but they're definitely told no one should be touching you in these areas, um, you know, as a child. As a kid, yeah. And also specifically, the, the protocol that I got when I was a kid was, adults should not touch you in this area except for your doctor or your parents. That's it. Um, And of course that doesn't mean that there's, you know, eliminate the possibility of child abuse. But the idea is that if there's an adult that's in their life, a teacher, a family member, babysitter, whatever it might be, um, who is touching them inappropriately, it gives them the understanding of, Oh, that's not where this person in my life is allowed to touch me. So it's, it's not, um, I think I see what what she's saying, and I think if it is conveyed as like all of these areas are bad across the board and all of these areas are okay across the board, that would be uh, troubling, right? But it's specifically to help kids understand what kinds of touch are okay from the adults in their life. Yeah. Thomas writes about uh, having to learn from their little girls. Sometimes they don't want to hug an extended family member. I think there's this there's this potentially damaging tendency we have. It's like hug grandpa, kiss grandpa on the cheek. Is that, are there some risks or some downsides to sort of that seemingly very innocent thing of hug grandpa, even though you don't want to, or hug, kiss grandma on the cheek, even if you're not comfortable. 
Yeah, that, I, I was mentioning this a little bit before when we we're talking about consent, like the, the question we should be asking kids, like, do you want to give grandpa a kiss before we go? You know, like giving, putting, giving them the option. And if they say no, then that's it. Um, and I understand that seems kind of like jarringly modern or something for some people because, it, you know, it's, it's innocent and it's sweet, right? Like just give them a, give grip a hug, you know, it's, it's familial, but I think the the <clears throat> message that is conveyed there is really, really important that you can say no, you know, if you don't feel like giving someone a hug today or you don't want to be kissed today, then that's okay. Um, and I think that that is a really common one that comes up with kids a lot. Yeah, that's true. Um, let me ask you this. This is probably a, its own series of podcasts, but there are <clears throat> there are either millennials leaving the church before they get married, um, leaving, leaving Mormonism after living a celibate life for 19 or 21 or 25 years. And then there's also post-Mormons who are married who get divorced, and all of a sudden they're staring this single life of sexuality and single life in the face mm-hmm. when they, the only person they've ever had any real sexual experience with is, is their, their former spouse or with no one. And I imagine it can be super confusing or scary or even terrifying to think about being a 40 year old woman now, now having to contemplate or 40 year old man or a gay man, or let's say a, a closeted um, you know, or, or a gay man in a mixed orientation marriage who then gets divorced and now is is looking at um, dating men, um, you know, with the scare of AIDS and STIs and other sorts of things. Um, you know, there are all sorts of scenarios of being, you know, and, and when my own children are adults, I can't really tell them about, you know, you can say use protection or or be safe or smart, but I don't even know what to say about having a healthy sex life as a single person. Mm. Um, are there resources or tips for people who are facing that, either millennials leaving the church or newly divorced Mormons? For getting back out on the dating scene? For, for learning how to navigate sexuality in dating, because mm. none of us, most of us weren't sexual when we were dating. Mm. So we don't know how to do that. Yeah, you know, Maybe this is a controversial opinion I have, but I think a lot of people feel this way, like they don't know how to navigate sex and dating. (laughs) Um, So I would say go back to the tips that we had talked about and self-education, you know, do some reading, do some research, get in the know, find some support systems for yourself, whether that's friends or YouTube vloggers that you like, podcasts you like to listen to, you know, find, fill out your support system in various areas of your life and just buckle up get ready for the ride because no one knows what they're doing dude no one knows what they're doing interesting Interesting. it's all a mess Mm -hmm. like everyone's learning everyone is making mistakes and if you make a mistake or you feel awkward or you feel clumsy you're you're the majority you know, like most people feel like that. The people who feel like they got it on lock and they know what's going on and this is a breeze. I've never met that person personally. Got it. People can go back to your YouTube channel and watch your old videos, right? You talk about a lot of this stuff. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff on uh, that stuff on my channel, but I think, um, you know, That's internet sex resources positive. are sex positive, yeah. right? YouTube sex plus there's a, there are a dime a dozen. Plus. There's a bunch of stuff online now. The harder thing is probably finding an in-person community where you can make friends and, you know, have well, more, more of a system. Get, be social and get outside the, get outside your box of your social scene, current social scene. That'll, you know, if you really feel like an alien on another planet, that'll help you maybe dip your toes into the water before you get out there, kind of get a feel for what life is like. Uh, on the outside and meetup.com I think is a really incredible resource for that. Whether you like hiking or you want to join a book club or you like crafting or you just want to have a crew to go grab drinks with after work on Friday, you can find all of that on meetup. I don't know about every single town, but I know that it's a very widely used resource at this point and it'll help you kind of find more community outside of, um, outside of the church 
and you know, dating sucks for everyone. <laughs> so having <laughs> friends to, you know, have a beer with or whatever can be a very cathartic. <laughs> Find your people. Um, I'm I'm mindful that 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 we always have this tendency to talk in sort of heteronormative, heterosexual sort of terms. And th there are listeners who are bisexual, there are listeners who are, um, you know, s exclusively same sex attracted, there are listeners who are trans. And I imagine that th there are, that a lot of what we talk about applies to everyone, not just heterosexuals or straight people, but I imagine that there are conversations and education and resources needed for our trans friends and our LGB friends. Is that your experience as well? Yes, that is definitely true. And there are a lot of resources for all of that as well. I think almost everything we've talked about applies across the board here and in, in we're speaking really generally, you know? Um, so I would say that applies, you know, if you're LGBT and moving, just coming out for the first time or, you know, exploring your identity for the first time, when I say find your community, find other LGBT people who can relate to your experience, who can support you in ways that cisgender and straight people don't always get, you know? <laughs> um, having people who really get it on that aspect of the journey can be very powerful. Um, not everyone has the luxury of having that in person. If you're near a city of, you know, decent size, then you should be able to find that these days. But if not, you know, go online. And, and, and there's so many communities online. It's, it's wonderful. It's everywhere. Um, find yours, you know, find, find your people. It takes a little time. Might have to do a little searching around and, you know, dipping your toes in different pools before you find the right temperature for yourself. But I think that's a positive uh, exercise. In Utah, there's the Utah Pride Center. You can go to utahpridecenter.org. They have counseling and support. They have men's support groups, women's support groups, trans support groups. Uh, yeah, and um, also just, you know, if you have a college or university in your town, even if you're not a student, the women's and LGBT centers on college campuses are very well connected in the local community and can definitely pass on, you know, give you the DL on what's going on in the community that you're in. It's a really good resource. So you're saying a non-student could go to the U of U LGBT center and maybe get some education even if they're not a student? Yeah, I mean, the LGBT centers that I've worked with, 100%, they'd be like, hey, you know, we're here to serve the community as well. But if you're worried about just, you know, going while the center is open, you could look online because a lot of them have websites with resources. They'll post calendars of events that are happening throughout the month you know, make a point to go to one of the events that are open to the community and, you know, get ready to put yourself out there. It can be uncomfortable if you're not used to it. It's not going to be a super comfortable experience the first few times. But once you, you know, get acclimated and feel more comfortable with the people you're around, it does get easier and you will start to find friends and family in those spaces. Hopefully. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. Um, l last question I'll just ask. And I, I wished I had asked you this, and this is going to go back to kind of you in your life. It's got to be weird to be a sex educator in the sense, or an activist or whatever you, however you might self-identify. I, I can imagine if, if men date you or men, men or women date you and they, they know this is your role, that like they might have weird expectations. You might feel pressure. It, it, I wish I'd asked you this in our, in our last interview, but are, are those all kind of real expected normal dynamics to sort of being someone who, who tries to help lift the, the dialogue about sex and sexuality? Um, yeah, I think more so when I was younger. These days I'm very upfront. Um, and I think the people that I end up having really close relationships with, part of why we have close relationships is because they understand that. They don't see me through this filter. They don't see me as a YouTuber. They see me as a Lacey and, you know, know me as a person. So I think that helps a lot. But of course, there's some weird expectations. And, you know, like we've been saying, a common theme in this conversation, I think, is just saying what you feel and getting it off your chest. It makes it a lot easier. And uh, with my partners in, in recent years, I've just said, hey, uh, just so you know, like teaching sex ed doesn't 
I don't want you to have any weird expectations. I'm a normal person. You know, I'm still learning. I don't know everything. Yes, I help young adults navigate this stuff, but a lot of it I'm still navigating myself. So, hey, let's calibrate expectations. And uh, I'm happy that those expectations usually haven't been on the table in the first place. So, yeah. So that's kind of leveled out. That's leveled out for you. It has. When I was younger, I think I, like, didn't fully understand how to uh, deal with that situation. And I think I was also encountering more people who um, were looking at me through more of a, like, sexualized lens. Whereas now I think people don't really sexualize me as much. Um Because I know the topics that I talk about are not, I don't know, when I was younger, I was more into like the mechanics of sex. But what I talk about more now is the stuff we've been talking about, you know, the health, the emotional aspects of sex, Um, not like, I don't know, how to eat your girlfriend out (laughs) or whatever. Right. Uh, last question that comes to my mind and it's kind of an obvious one, but I just want to touch about it. My understanding is STI rates are disproportionately high in Utah. So give some, yes. give some quick tips just about STIs if, if you're okay. Yeah. If you're hooking up outside of a monogamous relationship, then you want to make sure you're practicing safer sex. STIs are really high everywhere in the country right now. Um, they're the highest they've ever been in history. Um, and there's a lot of reasons for this, but the individual reality for each of us is that we need to be extra, extra vigilant and safe, um, using condoms, obviously, but also getting tested regularly. If there is a problem, um, if you have an STI, which often, you know, you wouldn't know you have an STI because most don't have symptoms. Uh, it's important to be able to catch that early. Most of this stuff isn't going to do any harm to you at all if you catch it early. So it's really just about being on top of your sexual health. If you're having multiple partners um, or if you're switching partners, you should be tested before changing partners, ideally. Um, And practicing safer sex every time, you know, knowing your partner's status, just those are all basic aspects of being a sexually safe and healthy adult in the era we live in where there's a lot of disease. (laughs) And I imagine it's kind of weird to like say, Hey, before we have sex, I want you to get tested, right? That, that could be something that makes someone feel, Oh, you don't trust me. You think I'm a slut. Like what's, yeah, what's going on. You think I'm a gigolo or whatever. (laughs) Well, the way I always put it, cause I have never had a partner that was, I require my partner be tested before we have sex. Um, you do. Yeah. I will not have any sexual, um, I will not engage in any sexual, um, practices that can, can tra- that can transmit an STI without knowing their status first. Um, a, so that if they have chlamydia or gonorrhea, they can be treated first, or if they have a viral STI so that we're really, really vigilant about condoms on top of birth control. And, um, yeah, that's my my personal practice, and I it has kept me very healthy and safe at this point in my life. Um, do people feel offended when I ask them? I don't think so. Um, and maybe part of that is, you know, just my sex ed life. They expect it. But I think it's a way – It's there's a way to say it that's not offensive. Like, hey, you know, this is a standard practice for me. I just want to make sure we're both healthy and safe and that helps me to relax so that I can have a good time. So before we go out on our next date, would you do me a really big favor and stop by Planned Parenthood and just get a quick STD test done? Or you could propose that you go together too. If you're, if you haven't been tested yet, be like, Hey, do you want to go together maybe next week? You know, and then we'll both know we're in the clear and we'll be ready to roll. That could, um, that could even be a little hot, a little bit exciting, right? I think so. I think it builds anticipation. And, you know, is it the sexiest thing on the planet? No. But <laughs> look, STIs aren't a sexy feeling either. And it's just a fact of life. We have to take care of ourselves. We have to take care of each other. And that means getting tested first. 
And and if somebody's like, well, you don't trust me or I'm offended or, you know, I, I don't think I should have to do that. I'm guessing that's a red flag. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's a, okay. Well, I guess we're not, I guess we're not having sex. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Your, your partner should be eager and willing to yeah. make sure they're healthy and you're healthy. Yeah. 100%. I mean, they should should want you to feel comfortable. And if you communicate that this is something that is really important for you to feel comfortable, they should be totally into that. And yeah, I mean, I can't imagine like a decent person guilting you or making you feel bad. Like that's not a good person, you know, even if they have reservations or maybe they feel insecure, those are things that can be talked about. Um, but ultimately your, your wishes should be respected. Um, and if not, you have every right to say, okay, this is not the right experience or partner for me. Yeah. I, I promise you that that was the last question, but now you made me think of one more just because of something you said. <laughs> I started at the beginning. There is sort of a, a mini trend in post-Mormonism to consider ethical non-monogamy kind of situations, whether it's swinging or polyamory mm -hmm. or whatever. Um, you know, there's always sort of this stereotype about threesomes and sometimes different, different types of porn kind of encourage thinking about this sort of thing. Do you have any sort of brief thoughts or words of wisdom around, around those types of topics? I know, again, those are their own podcast series, but yeah, brief thoughts. I would say the, the proof is in the pudding. If it's ethical non-monogamy, then there's no problems, right? So that's a situation where you really need to be thinking deeply about the ethics of the situation. The other thing I would say is that a lot of people these days, I feel, are turning to polyamory and non-monogamy as a band-aid on existing relationship problems, and that is a recipe for disaster. It is not a solution to relationship problems. It is a lifestyle and a relationship style. It should not be seen as like, well, let's try this to solve our problems. I think that's where people get in a lot of trouble and things can be very painful. Um, that's just my own personal experience with that. Other people, you know, might feel differently, but I have done the ethical non-monogamy thing, non thing and learned a lot. <laughs> <laughs> My understanding is it's, it's, it's rarely what people think. It's a ton of communication. It's a ton of work. It's a ton of work. It's super so stressful work. as emotions get involved. And as you're it trying be, to, yeah. you know, meet each other's needs and then introducing other people and their needs and emotions can really take things uh, out of control sometimes. Um, yes, you need to be ready for that. If, if that's the lifestyle, um, everyone needs to be really on board with the amount of emotional work it will take. Can it work? Can people be happy? Absolutely. Is it the solution to boredom or other relationship problems? No, it is not. Yeah. It's not, it's, it's unlikely to fix your relationship problems. And it, yeah it's more likely probably to accelerate other problems, that, the problems that already exist. Yeah. Yeah. Exacerbate the problems that already exist. Um, yeah. And uh, you know, and I, <laughs> there's always the idea of be careful what you wish for. There are a lot of guys who, who sort of say, Hey, I really want to open things up, you know, because I, I'd like to try other things and, mm -hmm. and it ends up being that they have a hard time finding a partner, but, but sometimes for she women, it's a lot. Yeah. It's a lot. Of, well, what's that? Then she gets laid a lot. Yeah. And he's outraged and, and frustrated and she's having a great time and it didn't, you know, and, and sometimes again, it ends to, it ends up, you know, causing the relationship to separate. And so it can really, if you really value your relationship, I'd say be extra careful. Yeah, I agree. Um, yeah. That's not a condemnation. Yeah. Just, you know, Oh, word to the wise. Yeah. Yeah. Well, AC Green, this has been a lovely two hours. I'm so grateful that you were willing to share. I'm. I'm we've loved having Natasha Helfer Parker on, but I love having a, a an extra different point of view. 
because you bring a perspective that is its own unique, valuable, lovely perspective. Thanks, John. Yeah, I am happy to be here. Hopefully it was helpful in some way to someone out there. And yeah, anytime. This was great. I think it already has been. The book is Sex Plus, Learning, Loving, and Enjoying Your Body, um, released September of 2018. And please buy it. We put a link to it in the comments section. Thanks. Of course, Lacey's uh, YouTube channel of the past was called Sex Plus, and there's a lot of good content there. And one last plug for your wonderful po new podcast, Lacey. Yeah, the podcast is called Indirect Message. You can find more information about that at laceygrain.tv slash podcast. And it's a really cool podcast about the influence of social media and the internet on society, on relationships, on individuals, on our collective health, yes, ethics, and, and all sorts of amazing, wonderful, important topics that uh, affect all of us very personally. And we talked a lot about that. If you didn't check out my three plus hours with Lacey <laughs> in our previous interview, check that out. Cause it was, I love that. I loved our discussion. So I did too. It was really great. And if you want to meet Lacey in person or um, Wayne Sermon of Imagine Dragons or Amber Scora of uh, Leaving the Witness, the book, or Natasha for Parker or me or Mindy Gledhill or lots and lots of other super cool uh, speakers, consider coming to ThriveBeyondMormonism.com, the, the, the Thrive Conference. It's November 17th in Salt Lake City. We've priced it at $15 a person. We're pretty much guaranteed to lose lots of money. But we want to support healing and growth and community for post-Mormons. It's a positive conference, looking forward, not backward. And we would love as many of you as possible who are interested to attend. We're like a few people away from our 1,000 people um, goal of having at least 1,000 people there. And I know we're going to reach that goal just within a day. But maybe we can get 2,000. So check us out at Thrive Beyond Mormonism. And finally... Um, please do consider supporting Mormon Stories Podcast um, with your personal donation, uh, a monthly donation of 10 bucks a month or 50 bucks a month or 100 bucks a month, whatever you can afford, really allows us to uh, invest in all that we need to invest in to keep this program alive. So please support us. You can give us a positive review on iTunes. You can give us a positive review on the Mormon Stories Podcast Facebook page. You can share these episodes with others. Uh, any of that is is really helpful. And a huge thanks to our donors um, who make so much of this possible. If you are already supporting Mormon Stories, the Open Stories Foundation, thank you so much. Lazy, can people donate to your podcast? No. That's interesting. Okay. Well, I guess I can't <laughs> I guess I can't plug that then. Nope. Donate to Mormon Stories. <laughs> make all the magic happen. <laughs> all right, Lazy Green. We hope you'll you'll come back anytime you're a friend of our program. And Thanks we think so much, you're great. Sean. It was lovely. Thanks, everyone. All right. Stay in touch. Thanks, Lacey. Bye. Okay. Bye.